This episode of Techzilla is sponsored by Domain.com and Netflix. Coming up on this episode, Inkscape. Is this free alternative to Adobe's Illustrator worth getting? Our very own web maven Stephanie Chu is here to give us a scoop. PC speakers don't have to be dull or tinny. We've got a roundup of some great sounding speakers, all under $150, and a couple high-end options too. What's the point of a wireless print server? So you can locate your printer anywhere, at least if you can get it to work. All that plus a big old stack of viewer questions on today's Techzilla. Welcome to Techzilla. I'm your host, Patrick Norton. And I'm Garnet Lee. Are you hosting today? I'm co-hosting with you again. How exciting. I know, I'm back. The same host two weeks in a row? First time since January, maybe? Weird. Thanks for having me back, Patrick. Patrick. Well, it's great to have you back. We have a great show lined up today. We have some really good stuff. A wireless print hub that actually works, a wireless print server. Vector versus raster. What's the difference and what does it matter? Stephanie Chu's here. That's our very own web maven. She's our... Uh, well, we'll explain it later. She's here to break it down for us. And filling in MP3 ID3 tags, often an annoying task, but if you want to keep your tunes in order, it's a necessary one. We got a free file that promises to minimize the pain of ID3 editing. But before we begin, a disturbance in the force you felt this weekend was the final death spasm of CompUSA's retail outlets, though the website and customer lift lives on. Purchased by the Tiger Direct folks, the final sales happened this past weekend. Did you stop by CompUSA Look, in the downstage? This isn't like the end of Alderaan. It's more like the uh, little blip out in the middle of the desert. It's just what's left of CompUSA. It's the it's the bare bones, right? Well, there were a lot. Of, there were actually quite a few stores. Left. There were like three or four in the Bay Area. I actually saw that, the one on Vermont Market. Randolph's behind the camera. He went. Chang went. Roger got a new notebook for like 500 bucks. I got an EVDO router and actually uh, some pretty cool accessories. So I thought the scoop on this deal was that when the group came in to clear everything out, that the right. prices went up and then they made like a fake cut under them. Well, that was how CompUSA kind of always worked in the stores, you know, the kind of like high daily prices right. because they were there, right? But now it's, I keep thinking about it, all the stuff, like all the emergency purchases I've made because CompUSA was open till 9 p.m. No more. I'm going to have to like try to get to fries by 7 o'clock or, you know, mail order for overnight delivery. Yeah, but you'll be better off in the end, right? Yeah. Well, they basically were cutting it like 10% every, every week for a bunch of weeks. So in the last couple of weeks, stuff was They cheaper. made their bed. You, you read it on the forums and everybody has their horror story about someone who went to CompUSA, right? And was like, oh my gosh, the service was this, or this guy told me about how I needed to have this piece for my computer. It, they, they made their bed. Well, I think also that just the, the popularity of online shopping has just crushed them in terms right. of prices. It's tough to compete with like Newegg and Tiger Direct, obviously. Uh, just cheap, cheap to buy online, not cheap to have brick and mortar store. So, oh, and something else shut down. <laughs> yes. Speaking of shutdowns, we had the last analog cellular phone service. It got turned off February the 18th. Analog cellular is survived by popular and a diverse collection of competing digital standards. Did you yes. have, what was your first phone? I had, <laughs> no, I'm dating myself, I had one of those Motorola bricks with a handy leather case. <laughs> my dad had one of those Motorola bricks. I didn't have my first, uh, I was 27 and 28 years old before I got my first cell phone. And it was actually digital. It was a CDMA phone. So did you have a StarTac? You know, no. Remember the StarTac? It was, was a, so popular. The StarTac that broke the third day <laughs> I had it. And I ended up actually gutting it and gluing it to a, I used a pencil uh, and glued the sides of it. I basically turned it into a non-flip phone, a chocolate bar. Whoa. Well, it, it cracked and they it were, would pinch my skin. Flimsy. They were a little flimsy. They were cheap. They, they were, were cheap as hell. A little flimsy. They were cheap as hell. So one of the know. things people liked about analog was the you know ability to go into rural areas and still have great coverage. What yeah. do you think is going to happen with digital now? Well, they've been trying to. In theory, they've been building out all the rural areas where they had really poor digital coverage because uh, they've basically they've known about this for years. It's not like this snuck up on anybody, and and they are basically giving basically forcing people to move from analog to digital coverage. But uh, if there's anybody out there who's been you know forced out of their, if their analog cell phone went dead a couple weeks ago and you don't know why, kick us an email since obviously you're not calling us at uh, techzilla at revision3.com. And what about all those old handsets? What Recycle them. Recycle them. Recycle of course. Them. Take them to a recycler. And get the battery out first. Yeah, either that or sell them on eBay. There you go. <laughs> so in other news, uh, also not quite meeting the mark. The Apple, the Apple iMusic, yeah. or the iMovie. iMovie, 1,000 rental titles by the end of February, according to Chris Breen over at Macworld. So he wrote in, and or he wrote on his blog, uh, when you select the iTunes All Movies link right now, you get 770 titles that's combined for rental and for sale. So unless there's some kind of big influx of new titles in the next few hours, Apple is going to miss that over 1,000 title mark that uh, Mr. Jobs promised us. Yeah, there's actually, there's, there's, they almost hit the 100 HD titles. They got like 90 HD titles. And actually, Much I closer. think there's more like, in terms of pure, the promise they made was rental titles. 1,000 rental titles, they actually have like 400 rental titles. So... It's, it's a little thin. 
It's Apple, a little thin. come on. If you're gonna, they, if they you, have some other. They still need to tackle that 24-hour thing. I, you know, I still have an issue with that. Well, yeah, but the, the 24-hour thing is pretty much the industry. It's a stupid, painful industry I standard, know. but it's the industry standard for almost every rental service. But when you're Apple, you can make changes like that, and you can get other people to handle. Apparently, them. it's a profitable change, a, a loss of profit <laughs> change. They're not willing to make. Right. That, I feel you. You know, that extra three hours could cost them like three dollars and ninety-nine cents on every SD rental, <laughs> <laughs> except for the people who actually watch them, like right then. I don't know. Anyhow, should we get the uh, viewer emails? We should do viewer emails. I like viewer emails. You like viewer emails? I do like viewer emails. You want to read emails. the first one? Yeah, we'll do it's it. So the first one is from Day Sleeper Ed. He wanted to put in his two cents on Derek's boot and nuke. So he writes in, in last week's show, Patrick mentioned D-Ban in the DOD spec in response to a viewer question. So by coincidence, I had been reading about it, and it seems that wiping a drive with successive overwrites is no longer DOD spec compliant, according to this document. That's a, whoa. Yeah. I thought that November. was the way you did it. And that's, well, that was traditionally one of the, the simplest way to do a, a, a DOD standard, you know, removal of the data on a hard drive. As of November, no longer, no longer acceptable for the DOD. So he goes on and says, I have no problems with D-Band. I've been using it on all the drives that I dispose of. I don't think users who wipe their drives clean have anything to worry about unless they think the NSA is after them. I like his, he included a little smiley face, of course. That's from Ed. <laughs> Ed. So, uh, what is the best way to wipe a drive when you're going to sell a machine? This well, is fine still. I mean, for, yeah, this is fine, right? If, if you're worried about like electron scanning recovery of data, then okay, the overwrites might not do it. You know, I mean, the, one of the best rumors of, of high security hard drive disposals, supposedly British intelligence services, they have a machine that grinds the platters from inside the hard drive to dust, and then they store the dust in a basement underneath like MI5 oh. or whatever, MI6 or, or whatever building it, uh, that these guys were headquartered in. That's my favorite story. That's but a little extreme. Acid dipping, grinding, grinding the surface off, um, bending them usually is acceptable, but uh, electromagnets would be look, kind of the classic. Now we're not talking about for sale. Decaucy. I mean, you're talking about physical destruction. Yeah. That's, well, of course, physical destruction really wipes everything out. Yeah, well, but for sale, this is fine. Yeah, for, for if you're selling your machine, Derek's boot and newt, you're yeah, good. don't worry. You, you guys, you're fine. You're all good with Derek's. White House computers, I can see where you'd probably want something a little more hardcore. Sure. But degaussing is still acceptable, too. Just get a giant magnet. Just wipe it all out. <laughs> get the refrigerator magnets. Now, in the last show, I talked about tools to liberate the movies from the peskier forms of copy protection. Many of you were inspired and emailed us your recommendations. Rec Room Noise summarized what quite a few of you were thinking. He says, these days, why bother paying for commercial applications if there are so many better open source and freeware apps? For Windows, he recommends using DVD Decryptor for ripping the copy protected VOBs to your drive. Okay. Now, DVD Decryptor hasn't been in development for years, but everybody out there seems to like it. Once you've ripped the files to your drive using DVD Decryptor, add Tyler and Demon, you can actually point something like Auto GK or DVD Shrink or Handbrake at them to resize and reformat them. You can also just leave those giant old DVD files on your drive and play them like that, which is kind of fun. It's a good thing to do with VLC. Now, Rick, who teaches film studies, is another big fan of DVD Decryptor. He writes in, imagine trying to teach a film studies class where you need to show clips. Now, given that hacking a player to allow you to skip warning messages or trailers is illegal, and the egos of some of the guys who write the menu loading screen seem to have grown to the point where you've seen the entire film before you get to the start option, you can lose five to ten minutes per lecture just getting to the clips. Very frustrating, Rick. I feel your pain. It's, can you imagine? Like, hold on, class. We just got to get through one more of these commercials before we show you the thing on the... Oh, man. They haven't gotten better. We were talking about that with Blu-rays last week. It's kind of scary. It is. They, give, they want to give you a lot of previews. A <laughs> yeah. lot of previews. Yeah, but there's something sad about when you've got like a three-year-old disc and you have to watch nine minutes of previews before you get to the movie. <laughs> it's like, yes. oh. I like the point about open source software. Did you see that Om Malik, you know, who has the uh, Giga Ohm show, he just he just got a new addition to his blog, a sphere, or, or his blogs. He's doing a uh, an open source blog. It's going to be all about open source startups. If you go over to VentureBeat, you can check it out. VentureBeat. I don't know you read that stuff. <laughs> you never know what I'm going to read. I read all kinds of things. You read some scary blogs, man. You like open source blogs. It's cool stuff. Uh, Venture Beats all, all about VC world. Gamer, open source, enthusiast, <laughs> former oil executive. While we're talking free, Alex in Sacramento says he left any DVD for the very free DVD 4.3 or DVD 43. He says he loved any DVD for the longest time. It allowed him to play around with any DVD conversion software. Then he found DVD 43. Same thing, free. In the system tray, you get a little red face. You insert a DVD, you wait for a green face, and you rip away. 
So, like DVD Decryptor and any DVD, you'll need an additional tool like Handbrake or DVD Shrink to format and burn that data. DVD43 also gets a shout out from Nathan, Mark in the UK, who throws DVD Decryptor at the rare disc DVD43 won't handle, and Jeremy, who uses it with Handbrake. Finally, quite a few of you use DVD Fab's products, either the limited but free DVD Fab AC Decryptor or the full featured $49 DVD Fab Platinum, including Johnny, Roland from Hermosa Beach, Wayne and RJ, Casey in Chapel Hill, who say they usually get new copy protection schemes sorted in a month, Andrew who adds they have options for nearly every portable format, and James from Australia who uses it on a Mac running Parallels. Wow. Thanks, everybody. This is, that's a DVD-43. i got to check that one out. Dude, I'm seriously overloaded now. It's like I have more choices for handling how I'm going to get DVD info off of the DVD than I, I really... I just want to put a DVD in the drive, get it off, and then go watch it. Well, it would, I mean, I'm sorry. I, I mean, I'm kind of user-oriented. I understand. Well, DVD Fab. Spend the 50 bucks, get DVD Fab. If you don't want to spend the money, try DVD 43 or try uh, DVD Decryptor. I think, I think after all that, I may try out DVD 43. So thanks, everyone, for your comments and your questions. We want to get more of them. So if you've got something you want to get off your chest or just to uh, share something cool with us, email us at techzilla at revision3.com. All right, we want to take a moment to thank one of the sponsors that helps us support the show, Netflix. I don't care if you're an action horror drama fanatic, chances are your local rental store has bupkis for high-definition movie rentals. If you're looking for a steady supply of titles, DVDs, or Blu-ray discs, check out Netflix. Just select your titles online and Netflix will mail them to you. Plus, with 40 shipping centers, almost all deliveries happen in a single business day. No parking, no late fees, no hassle. And uh, no extra fees if you take more than 24 hours to watch it. Plans start at $4.99. And as a TechZilla viewer, you can get a very free trial by signing up at www.netflix.com slash TechZilla. And like the dudes on the porch used to say, we'd like to thank you for your support. Last week, we promised you a great segment on vector versus raster graphics, along with a free Illustrator alternative called Inkscape. Unfortunately, our guest was up to her eyeballs in jury duty. Now that she's done with her civic duties, I'd like to welcome Revision 3's very own interactive designer, Stephanie Chu. Stephanie, thanks for being on the show. Oh, no problem. Glad to be here. Uh, I got to ask, what's an interactive designer? An interactive, well, what I do is anything that the users see is what I make. So I color those pixels, <laughs> pretty much. So. You heard pixels, as it were? Uh, pic uh, well, they called me the pixel princess on my business card, which I... That's kind of scary. Is it? I don't know. I thought it was supposed to be cute, but... Not high maintenance? No, <laughs> definitely not. So we actually had a question from a bunch of viewers who were, especially when we were talking about, like, creating um, graphics, right? So you're mm -hmm. creating graphics, you're cutting out stencils, and they're right. like, what's the difference between a vector graphics tool and a raster graphics tool? Or, like, what's vector versus raster graphics? Well, um, it's... I'm glad that we're having this segment because it is just so important whenever we get into graphics and it'll save you a lot of time if you know the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. And so raster graphic is, um, let's just say like a photograph, a digital photograph. It's mm -hmm. made out of dots. And a so, bit map. <laughs> yeah, a bit map, a bit map, JPEG, or mm -hmm. you know, your, your standard Photoshop files are usually gonna be raster graphics. And those are good for anything with a lot of color um, and anything just made out of dots. And on the flip side, vector graphics are not made of dots. They're made of points and lines. So they're, uh, the graphics are drawn mathematically, mm -hmm. and that means that they can scale as big as a, as big as a billboard or larger or as small as, you know, say for a business card. So, so it could be like, you know, the, 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 I, the thing that always got me is when they went from bitmap to, or, or raster graphics to vector graphics on GPS. So you could actually like, you know, zoom in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Google Maps is, would be a great example. Oh, of, yeah, yeah. If you got an iPhone, I mean, just bloop, you know, <laughs> and you can see, I mean, those, that's a vector, vector scaling. Or, right. It, they sometimes call it SVG, scalable mm -hmm. vector graphics. And so uh, some typical file types for vector are, you know, Adobe Illustrator, EPS, PDFs, um, PostScript. Um, right. right. But if you went to like the Google, if you went to the Google satellite stuff, then that would be a case where it was actually uh, raster graphics. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a photograph. If you're, if you're looking at, you know, someone's door and you see, you know, a, a picture and it gets blurry when you stretch it out, um, mm -hmm. it's because those dots are stretching. So you know, when they're stretched out, it's going to be blurry. All right, so, want to make a logo. So you use a vector graphics tool or a raster gra raster, raster. <laughs> Language is hard. Yeah, it is. Uh, well, if you're going to make a logo, I highly recommend starting in Adobe Illustrator mm -hmm. or any sort of vector tool because uh, and eventually this logo is going to be repurposed. It's going to get printed, it's going to, you're going to have signage, you know, and so what you want to do is plan for that scaling. Right. And so if you ever go to a printer or if you ever want to make t-shirts or anything, you want to make sure that you use a vector program because you're going to want to separate the colors and scale it and tweak it. 
Is it also, I mean, does it reduce the file? I keep thinking of like EPS files, encapsulated postscript files. Yeah. Is that yeah. like the classic vector graphics format? Uh, it is. I mean, I tend to convert everything to PDF. Mm -hmm. I mean, EPS and AI are, are heavily supported, right. but PDF is just so even, you know, it's, it's more widely <laughs> supported. <laughs> so. You've got the Adobe Player, you're good to go. Uh, Adobe Player. No, um, that's something different. <laughs> ignore me. The Adobe um, Reader, I, actually. So, yeah, do you want to have. Uh, Adobe uh, Distiller is good because you know it, it turns PostScript files into PDFs. Good so. point. And you so, don't want to make it press ready. So. I need to remove a background from my portrait photo. Where do I start? That is a raster uh, graphic request. So you're going to use Adobe Photoshop because you're working with individual pixels and portions of a photograph, mm -hmm. and you're not just removing points and lines. So and much Photoshop. more useful than say you know Paint in Windows. Yeah, I. I don't use paint. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you're making a poster. It's got both right. photos and text. What should you be using? Well, that's a nice project because in that case, you'll get to use both Photoshop and Illustrator. Mm -hmm. um, I recommend starting with any graphic element, uh, uh, like a photograph, mm -hmm. in Adobe Photoshop. Um, since it's a poster, you're going to want it to be pretty high res, at least 300 DPI. And when you're done manipulating those photos in Photoshop, you're going to import them into il Illustrator. And that's when I would go ahead and lay down the text, mm -hmm. um, you know, make sure the text is turned into outlines. And then when you're done creating those ve vector graphics, you export to either EPS or just print to PDF. So when you have, a, you have your e EPS, your PDF file, if you scale it, does the bitmap picture inside of that doesn't really scale, though? Or it'll no, scale like it, up to it's a still, point it's then still then a bitmap raster image. And so even though um, you're in a PDF, it's still going to get blurry, but you know, hopefully, it's high high res enough that you know won't be noticeable when you print it. But your your text is going to look great when you when you. Go, so printing on a t-shirt <laughs> probably be okay, but if you try to put it on a wall, it might look a little funky. Yeah. Got it. So Photoshop, six hundred fifty bucks without tax. Oh uh, yeah, it's pretty pricey. I mean, it it's. Totally worth it in my book, but well, it, this is what you do. You're a yeah, professional yeah, graphics manipulator. I mean, yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna go professional, you might as well get the best products. Mm -hmm. And and I am a huge fan of the Adobe products. Um, but if you if you're on a budget, there are some other alternatives. There is Corel Painter, which is going to run you for about um, probably under four hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. But the free the free one is GIMP. So and GIMP's if it's a classic tool. It's basically like the open source version of Photoshop. I, I guess so. You oh, look yeah. pained when you, you're <laughs> like, yeah, sure. I, I, I like my Adobe tools. Um, Student discounts are worth checking out for oh, yeah, the yeah, Adobe totally. stuff. Yeah, when I was in college, I always <laughs> bought my software from Cal Poly. So. And it gets cheap. Ridiculously yeah. cheap. Yeah, pretty cheap. Um, uh, so, Illustrator, six hundred bucks. Yeah, Illustrator is also uh, going to cost you a pretty penny, uh, but there are also some, <clears throat> excuse me, other alternatives and there's Corel Draw, they, they also have an, a, a vector editing program and then, mm -hmm. then you've got Zara Extreme and then you have what we've been waiting to get to is Inkscape. Inkscape. Yeah. Now, that, I mean, it's, we've been getting a bunch of people emailed actually after our stenciling thing. Like, have you seen Inkscape? It's amazing. It's like right, totally like right. Illustrator, except it's free. Yeah, and, and you know, I could see why they're so excited about mm -hmm. that because, you know, if you're going to do stenciling, Inkscape will help you do that because it, it does a lot of the things that you need to do in Illustrator. Um, basic things like painting, drawing, uh, you know, clone stamping, and just and they've got a nice array of you know colors that you can use. And so um, it also imports the file types that we've already talked about, like EPS oh, that's and really cool. PDF. And so you know. If, even if original artwork was done in you know those expensive programs, you can still use this free program to um, get your work done. Now you actually, we should. Now one of the things we were talking about earlier is that right. the palettes, the tools, the icons, like usually like GIMP, they've right. tried to give you a sort of a Photoshoppy feel, even though it feels very yeah. different. How about Inkscape? Is that okay, well, up here? I right now I'm running Photoshop. Let's go ahead and minimize this. And <laughs> apparently, it's been a while since I've been in Photoshop. Right. <laughs> well, Inkscape here. Has done something a little bit different. Let me see which one is it. They've done something a little different here, um, and I think that they've made a nice effort to try to be uh, more meaningful with their icons. But mm -hmm. and that's to be applauded. But the drawback for a lot of people is that they just aren't familiar with right. these icons. They look very much very different. Um, 
So if you're, if you're used to. to Illustrator, this is going to be painful. If you want to move up to Illustrator, you're going to be spending some time like trying right. to figure out. Right, right. There's, there's, a, there's a learning curve with Inkscape that's a little bit um, larger than I would like. Mm -hmm. um, I do recommend uh, taking a quick read, at least, through the user manual. Um, and that leads me to another uh, down, I wouldn't say downfall, but a little thing about Inkscape is that they use a lot of jargon that mm -hmm. not everybody is going to be familiar with. So Jargon like graphics maven jargon or jargon like where did they come up with this term? It must have been the people that wrote it jargon. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, they're, they're just going out of their way to be different and, you know, in, in the, you know, for them it's probably more meaningful, but to, you know, the newbie users it doesn't mean a whole lot. Got it. And so, uh, yeah. So here we have Inkscape um, and you can see these icons down the left and um, let's see, you can just go ahead and draw something like, oh, another thing about Inkscape, I'm sorry, okay. is that before, <laughs> I just noticed it because I'm trying to, you know, move my screen over and in Photoshop, I'm going to press my space bar and move the screen <laughs> over. And here, it's like the, the, the shortcuts are so much different. I mean, they're going to, it's going to frustrate people. It frustrated me. And then, you know, with, if Mac users, you use command, mm -hmm. but, you know, if you're a Mac user using Inkscape, you're going to use control almost like as if you're. It's Still on, on a PC, mm -hmm. right? So, anyway, so we can just go ahead and just draw something, and I do like the cal the calligraphy uh, painter here. So it's Patrick. <laughs> hey, it's an amazingly yeah. lifelike rendition. <laughs> anyway, so you can save this as a. I'm sorry. Oh, see, here we go. You can save this as a PDF and mm -hmm. or SVG, and you know it's a standards compliant. Know, programs so there you go and I actually drew something earlier so did you find a lot of were there any tools missing from Illustrator that you would, would like to see in Inkscape or um, I haven't found any tools missing I mean it's it's pretty basic when I use a vector program I'm basically just drawing points and lines and coloring uh -huh. things and uh, you know here's Adobe Illustrator and I haven't found too much else. I mean, Illustrator has a lot of cool things like the filters and live trace and everything. Um, live trace is pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Where you basically feed a picture into it. Oh, and yeah, it kind of and it turns them into uh, vector graphics. And it's pretty awesome. You should do another segment on that. Do you um, have one more thing you wanted to show us? In there? Um, let's see. I drew a so this is a drawing you made in Inkscape? Yeah, you know, I saw a little robot on your laptop the other day, so I just thought I'd make one that was it's so perky. It's in love. Thumbs up, <laughs> thumbs down on Inkscape? Um, I'd say, you know, it's free, so mm -hmm. I would just go ahead and go for it. Um, it's going to do everything that you need, uh, basically, in, in, illustri in Illustrator, so I'd say go for it. Stephanie, thank you so much. You're Ladies welcome. and gentlemen, if you want to, you got some questions about Vector versus Raster Graphics, you got some more uh, graphical questions out there, some website questions or website design questions, we'll fire them to Stephanie if you email us, techzilla at revision3.com. We'll be right back. It's time again for the freebie download of the week. Nifty software that won't cost you a penny. And today's pick, MP3 Tag. If you've ripped a large collection of CDs, chances are you might need to edit some of those tags in your collection. While you could use something like iTunes to edit them, generally it can be a pretty clunky and slow affair. With MP3 Tag, just open up the folder where your files are stored and edit away. Plus, MP3 Tag lets you edit many other digital music formats, including AAC, FLAC, AUG, and WMA. Once you launch the application, all you need to do is open up the directory where the files you want to edit are stored. Select them, and it will be automatically imported into MP3 Tag. If you don't have any pre-existing tags, just use the tag sources from the drop-down menu and select the appropriate online database. Now, you can select each file individually to edit, or you can select them as a group. If you want, you can also swap out images or select new ones that you want to use in their place. Once you're finished with the changes, just click the icon shaped like a floppy disk to save. If you have additional files you want to change, just follow the same process. Now whether it's an mp3, aug, or flag file, it's best to have each individual album in its own separate folder. mp3 tag, it's just that easy and just that free. So give it a try and organize all those digital music files as you see fit. Hey, so as long as we're talking about digital music, Patrick, what is all this stuff you got here? We got a big stack of speakers, because decent sounding speakers, 
could really suck, right? Or, or well, actually, <laughs> decent surrounding speakers shouldn't suck. They should be good. Anyway, we got an email from BJ in Jersey who writes in. He says, I've migrated all my music listening to my computers. What computer speakers from like two piece on up sound really good? Could you cover all price point, please? BJ in Deptford, New Jersey. So, uh, my personal favorite, remember my old cubicle back oh, in my yeah. old office? Oh, yeah. Well, I had a big old pair of BW 601s connected to a 500 watt amplifier. Nice setup. It Economical. Was a little out of control. Well, I was recycling some older, you know, audio gear. Who doesn't have B and W just as old audio gear to sit around with house? Well, I could no longer use them because I, I live in a very small house now, so they ended up in my very small cubicle where I could yes. have a dance party with the entire floor. But um, I, I love using like stereo gear. Basically, I stack my monitor on top of the amplifier and throw a couple speakers and a subwoofer there, and you've got ridiculous audio quality. Um, you can also, if the speakers aren't shielded, you can make your old CRT monitor go funky colors and do bad things. So that's something to watch out for. But 100 bucks or so seems to be the tipping point for really good speakers. Most of them cheaper than that are cruddy. I mean, you know, did I mention buying old audio equipment, maybe at yard sales? You can actually get some amazing uh, speakers really cheap if you keep your eyes open on Craigslist or something. If you want a, um, something more high-end, we tried to get Bose's new uh, $400 computer music monitor in, uh, but they declined. Uh, think of them as the desktop version of that clock radio. If you own one of those, put these on your list. If you if you like that Bose sound, some people really like it. It's very... Don't, don't get me started. You know, my, my mantra is friends don't let friends buy Bose. I mean, some people really enjoy what Bose does to audio. <laughs> Apparently you don't. Very, very boomy low end and little tinny top end. Yes. Well, in which Fantastic. case, well, you actually, before we get into a, <laughs> the yes. ultimate version of tinny top end, um, you were talking about uh, $400 speakers that you love. Oh, so, the, so you know the guys over at THX, and as a matter of fact, one of these pairs that you have up here, the Eclipses are THX certified, right? So that's, yeah. a, that's a rigorous program that, that involves both uh, manufacturing standards and listening standards to, to meet the THX standard. Those guys actually worked with Razer, the guys who make the gaming mics. Right to develop a set of speakers from the ground up to be THX certified. They actually worked in their labs to develop these things. And they're very funky looking. They're they orbs. Are, they're, they're like very Mark cool. Levinson, only really different. So they're, so they're downward firing and they're projecting mm -hmm. off of a plane because when you get into high frequencies, the sound coming off this cone is very narrowly projected. Right. So you have to be right in front of it, be in the sweet spot. By projecting down and then distributing it, you get a much richer sound field. They work great, man. They sound so good anywhere. Music and gaming, primarily gaming. Um, actually, so they're fantastic for music. Right. I mean, the music really sings on them. I mean, anything from you know like old Frank Sinatra through the craziest thrash melody when throw at them. They're very tight because they've also done. I mean, you know, speakers you call it bi amplification, but each sure. driver in the speaker set has its own discrete amplifier. Fancy. I mean, this is a hardcore setup. Reason, I mean, I don't know, is it reasonably priced to say 400 bucks for that? I think the sound quality is well worth it. They're, yeah. they're I mean, rock solid. I've had a you know $600 pair of speakers with a $500 amplifier plugged into my computer, so $400. These things are rock solid. Cheap. If you put them in a study, they are the only set of speakers you're gonna need. I was really impressed with them. Okay, so you like those. I really, yeah, I really liked them all. And the bass was really tight. I mean, this is, <laughs> what is, tell me that's not a subwoofer. <laughs> that actually is a subwoofer. <laughs> this is, Okay, so we actually have uh, this is we have some speakers that Creative sent in, and I've, the guy, you know, the, the BJ was like, oh, two point one speakers, right? That's like a subwoofer and, and a pair of speakers, right? And uh, Creative, I asked for the Creative, the Itrig three thousand, because they're they're usually selling for about ninety bucks, uh, and they have like the world's tiniest subwoofer. That's what you're looking at. Uh, that's and a recycled walkie-talkie speaker, right? It's a little bigger than a walkie-talkie speaker, um, and actually a pair of uh, you know sticks for the for the mid to high end. Um, very tinny, and woofer gets blown out pretty easy. You basically have to spend a lot of time riding the little uh, woofer control. So it's got a very nice separate volume control, and it's the only speakers we have here that, uh, uh, no, one of the only, the creatives actually both have uh, uh, headphone output, so you don't have to use the one in the front of your computer. Um, but uh, it was amazing how little bass actually came out of this uh, device unless you cranked it up a lot. Not bad, you know, but for 90 bucks, I want better. And actually, the kind of next step up, creative, the folks at Creative, the PR people are like, you have to check out the T40s. They're amazing. And actually, they sounded pretty clean. Roger, our producer, really liked these. That's the power supply kicking out the back end of them. Uh, the Gigworks T40, uh, these sell anywhere from like 130 to 140 bucks. Um, they've got like basically the difference between these and the T20, the T20 is only going to have the single uh, mid-range driver instead of the dual. You thought they sounded a little boomy in the mid-range. 
Well, I think one of the things you get out of these is they're very tight in the right. mids, first of all. And one of the reasons they're tight in the mids, if you look at the composite material they're using in the cones, it's a very rigid material. Like Kevlar-y stuff. Yeah, it's very rigid material, so you get really great tangent response, but I think the way they have these things set is to make them very, very warm in the middle to hide the fact that they have no base punch. Yeah, and they, they have basically like, so we have the little base port here, right? So it's like a tuned uh, case for that. So um, what we notice though is that there's not a lot of low end on this. So no. if you're listening around your speaker, you're listening as, you know, uh, I want to say, man, I'm, I'm going to be mean and say light FM, but if you're listening to a lot of mellower jazz and, and any of stuff where like classic rock where you're not like, you know, rocking out and trying to wake up the entire office, but you'll notice something. Um, I like bass, but I'm not the one who turned the bass all the way up. For a lot of the songs we're listening to, to have any sort of, of presence at the low end, you needed to crank the bass on these all the way up. But a nice, clean speaker, no subwoofer uh, attached to these, which is nice because it can make it really simple to set them up at your, at your computer at work. Not you know, bad for music. Not bad for music. Not bad for music. Not not bad. Nice clean one. Uh, for well, I was kind of shocked. I expected these to be a lot more expensive than they were. These are Klipsch's Pro Media 2.1s. I'm a big fan of Klipsch's iFi they were selling for a while, which is a iPod player. I'm a big fan of Klipsch speakers. Period. Um, these were really cheap. If you shop around, you can find these for like 115 bucks. And the thud you hear is is uh, me dropping stuff. Um, and it's only like a six and a half inch subwoofer. Uh, but, but it kicks. So one of the reasons it kicks is because it has a bash amp in it. And man, this thing throws. Yes. I, have, I actually have the 5.1 set at home for my, for my gaming rig. And I've been happy with it, very, very happy with it for a long time. Good stuff. Yeah, and if you if you like listening to music that has a low end, if you want to feel uh, you know being beaten on a video game, if you you know if you like the the, the 1812 overture, if you like a good oh, yeah. baseline, even in a actually like Sinatra sounds amazing on this, Johnny Cash sounds amazing on this, um, Neko Case is like country singer really like sounds amazing on this, really nice clean high end, you know good solid detailed mid range, kicking 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 much louder than we can even stand sitting in the studio being this close to him, um, 120 bucks, 115 bucks if you shop around. And a really good, like, nice, solid build, which I really oh, yeah. was kind of Oh, yeah. If you look at the satellites, surprised. you can see why they do well. They've got a great mid-range driver and the nice horn tweeter. Great combination there. It's good. This is gear that will give you best of all worlds, I think. Yeah, I, and I, I keep it making it kind of shocked at how cheap these were. You know, for like a good a, deal. 120 bucks is pretty amazing. The 150 if you don't shop around too much. Um, those are kind of like the part of the reason I, I picked the Creative and the Klipsch's is because you can pretty much find them at any computer store uh, or Absolutely. any computer store online. They're pretty common. They're they're pretty good brand names. The Klipsch has excellent quality. Creative has a good rep. Um, I was actually was I was really disappointed by the iTrig the 3000s. They're not bad, uh, but when you started listening to the the T40s and the 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 Klipsch speakers, it was amazing how much more music you could find for around the same price. So, should we get out to the next thing? Let's Another do email? It. Uh, we actually did an email uh, about print servers coming from Scott, who writes in and says, well, you wanna read this one? Sure. Okay. He says, uh, Scott says, I'm looking at print servers for my home network and I can't understand why there are wireless print servers <laughs> and non-wireless print servers. So if it's plugged into your router or switch, isn't it accessible to all the computers on your network? I have an HP PhotoSmart D7360 that I'd like to share on my network without having to sh have it shared on one physical computer, which must be on all the time. That's a honking thing you're sitting up there. Print <laughs> servers are still at least $50, and I don't want to buy one that won't work. That's good point. I wouldn't either. Thanks, Scott. Scott, uh, who's in South Bend, Indiana. Here, you go put this over there. All right. You, you'll be right back. Rah. Gently. That's my personal printer. Don't hurt that. <laughs> First of all, um, the whole the reason they have wireless print servers is so you don't have to be near an Ethernet jack or run an Ethernet cable throughout your house, which can actually be incredibly useful. You can come back. Dude. Oh, okay. Sorry. I thought I was going to be like Vanna with the. Printer. There'll be no Vannaing today. The uh, the second thing is is actually for fifty bucks um, uh, is a really cheap print server. And I'd like to know what you're finding for fifty bucks for a print server. A lot of print servers don't work very well. In fact, uh, I use Linksys for almost all my gear. And one of the most frustrating, disappointing, and tragically just just frustrating experiences I've ever had uh, was with a Linksys print server. And I, I should point out my my you know my my cable router, my N you know my N wireless access point, uh, three of the five uh, Ethernet cards in my house, all Linksys, love Linksys. The the print server you took it out back of the woodshed. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> it's it's like propping up one side of, of uh, my workbench actually, um, and and it, it's not just it's not just Linksys because the problem in theory it's very simple. You're you know, you're emulating a USB connection, sending it over the the Ethernet, the the network, and you're going to communicate. A lot of times the um, the all of your special computer 
printer monitor stuff, the thing that tells you your ink is running out or yes. watches it. A lot of times those don't actually work over these. Um, but I just couldn't even get anything to connect. So a lot of times you have to find out if whether or not your printer works. So if you're lucky, if you're looking at a print server, find out if the company has a list of supported printers. Um, I actually found out the one I ended up using was an Airport Express, uh, not for music, but actually uses a print server. Pretty handy tool. Yeah, they, they have the Bonjour driver, the little Bonjour utility loads up on your XP 2000 uh, Vista system, or at least XP that I've definitely used. And uh, the iFelix unofficial Airport Extreme and Airport Express printer compatibility list, which has an amazing list of printers, like pretty much everything anybody's tested that gotten into work, they email this guy back. And one of the nice things, one of the weird things about certain Apple products like the Airport Express is you have a tight uh, knit community that goes out of their way, uh, sorry, a tight knit community that goes out of their way uh, to tell people about everything it can do. So in that case, this turns out to have some of the best support uh, as a print server for uh, Mac or PC, oh, simply sweet. because there's that hardcore group of Mac people who want to tell everybody about how wonderful it is. So take advantage of that. Um, one of the many uses of that toy. I mean, that thing has been put to use in all kinds of ways by the community, right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it, it's for music. It's a you know, it's it's <laughs> it's got the music. It's got the USB for the printer. It does the whole Ethernet. To, you know, it's it's a pretty slick device. Um, but if you're buying a print server, I gotta say, uh, call tech support for the company before you buy it and see whether or not your printer is supported. Um, Make sure if you buy one and you can't check their websites or call the company first or have a friend who's actually used it, make sure you can return the device. Because I've found not just in, you know, I, I, I tease Linksys because I have a long relationship with them because everything in my house is on Linksys. But uh, uh, definitely make sure if you buy a print server that you can return it if it doesn't work with your printer because you don't be shocked if you try to get a printer server running and it doesn't work. It's, it should be simple. So after, after the big Patrick Norton brain dump here, I'm presuming that you're going to have links, all that kind of stuff in the show notes? Yes. Absolutely excellent. <laughs> we'll have a link to iFelix's page <laughs> and to this. Cool. <laughs> For those of you uh, watching who don't remember where those show notes are, just remember these, revision3.com slash techzilla. All right. Before we go, I want to thank, uh, take a minute to thank uh, one of our sponsors that has brought this episode to you. Domain.com is their name. They are big supporters of Revision 3. And they've got some serious deals on domain names and hosting. Shop around. They promise us no funky deals, just $8.75 to register a domain, and they'll make that reg private if you drop another 5 bucks. Don't take my word for it. Price out your next domain at Domain.com versus the other guys and see who's got the best straight-up deal. And do us a favor. Type in Techzilla, T-E-K-Z-I-L-L-A, -L -L when you check out at Domain.com, and not only will you chop 25% off the price of your domains, and that's that's 671 for a domain name and 25% off all hosting plans. You'll actually help us get credit for the sale, which helps us keep bringing the show to you. That's about as good as it gets. Check them out at domain.com. All right, Patrick, so you ready to do some of those questions? First one comes from Ben. Ben! And he writes and he says, I, I've heard rumors of EA announcing officially that they'll be releasing Rock Band for the Wii. Wee. Can you bring any merit to this or additional insight like a release date or a quarter? I don't know squat about it, but you're the gaming maven. All right, well, let me do the best I can for you, Ben. First of all, they're definitely doing Rock Band for Wii. Besides the fact that it just makes sense, John Riccatello, the EA CEO, did confirm in an investor's call that it was coming out, it was part of their projected earnings, so of course they're gonna do that, that makes right. sense, right? Sometime probably before the Christmas shopping season. You know, if I had to guess, I'd probably say it'll be out this summer because that's a great time, you know, just coordinates well and it gets them geared up to be, you know, potentially bringing something else out in the fall, which is what you wanna do, right? I'm, I'm with you now. All right, so the Game other thing, how about this though? Announced last week, Disney is going to do a product called Ultimate Band. And what, they, <laughs> don't look so skeptical, Patrick. It's not that bad, it's not that bad. The idea here is that it's it's rock band. Is there mouse but, ears? <laughs> no, come on, Disney has Hannah Montana. They're serious oh. rockers. Sorry, and the high school, the musical. <laughs> so so they're, first of all, they're going to do real music or real music, including, I love how the press release included emo, because who doesn't think of emo and Disney together, right? But the idea is that you don't have to buy instruments. Their big thing is you're gonna be able to play this with your Wiimote, which already is, you know, Wiimote's already a controller that you're moving around with, right? There's a lot of potential here. I don't, I'm gonna go on a limb and tell you that this game might be bigger than Rock Band because you don't have to buy anything extra. Huh. This is a great idea. But isn't half the fun of Rock Band having that weird guitar controller? For us, maybe. Okay. But think about mainstream, Disney name, Great song selection, if they can get that part down, and a controller that already comes with the box of the Wii. It's, I, I defer to your superior gaming knowledge. Hannah Montana, huh? 
<laughs> we got an email from Mike who writes in, I have a long Ethernet cable that I'm trying to wire to a room with a 360 in it. The problem is whenever I run it through the wall, the connection doesn't work. But when I run it across the floor, the cable works fine. The only logical explanation for this is interference. So I must ask, what can cause interference with an Ethernet cable? Mike, great question. Uh, power cables running parallel to the uh, power lines, actually, in your walls is the most likely culprit. When you have a you basically 120 volt line, uh, you want to cross it at 90 degrees. That would be perpendicular. Perpendicular. Right. Do that again. You want them to cross like that. If they run like this, you can end up losing your Ethernet signal. So try routing it in a different manner. Or go wireless or get a longer Ethernet cable. You, you run into these kind of problems all the time with any sort of cabling. Behind your home theater rig, you right. might have the same thing. If you hear a buzz coming from your speakers, you probably have some sort of field set up. Watch all your cables. The old ground hum, too. Yeah, you get a little ground hum. So just watch your cables, take a look at it. You can probably get yeah. it sorted out. And then we have our last question, Patrick. It comes from Greg. He says, I'm wondering if converting audio files from MP3s at 320 kpps mostly to the Apple lossless codec will actually increase the bit rate. Most of the ones I've been doing this to can end up at a bit rate from anywhere from 281 to 1152 kpps. What's <laughs> up? Does changing the codec from MP3 to Apple lossless increase the quality? Um. Yeah, you know, the, like you ever see the sponges, right? And you add the water <laughs> to the sponge, and it goes. There's not yeah. really anything additional there, but you, you've made it bigger. I think it's essentially what you're doing here, Greg. Yeah, I mean, but starting with MP3, which is a lossy, right. a lossy format. So we're talking about something that's already had that there. What there's no real point to go back to lossless. Going from a CD to Apple lossless, good. Going from an MP3 and AAC, a, a, basically any compressed file, any heavily compressed, any lossy compressed file, don't bother trying. Basically, what's happening here is. You're, 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 I guess you're running iTunes probably because that's the only thing that does Apple lossless, right? It's basically going, I think there was some music here and some music here and some music here and some music here and it's basically pretending, it's making up, it's, it's, it's. Yeah, this is a really interesting sort of thing when you think about it because the MP3 has had these bits compressed and right. pulled down and what he's doing now is coming back into iTunes and asking it to figure out what chunks to plug back in to make it real. It's kind of like when you take a car that's got a lot of rust holes in it, you put Bondo in it, <laughs> it looks kind of like it should. It may not actually feel like it should, and the Bondo may fall out in a couple of years. Just, just find the original CDs and use those. Otherwise, uh, leave the 320 uh, kbps MP3s as MP3s. Trust us, it'll it'll work fine. Speaking of which, please, 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 please don't forget to write us with your questions, your answers, your suggestions, your comments, your complaints, your product review requests. We live to serve, uh, up to a point anyway. Send in those emails to techzilla at revision3.com. Plus, if you need to talk to other fans about topics covered on the show, visit our forums at revision3.com slash forum. And don't forget to check out previous episodes of Techzilla. They're just waiting to be rewatched at revision3.com slash techzilla. More details, as always, will be placed on the site. Coming up in the next show, you excited? Absolutely. I if you're going to be back. I don't know, you're doing Xbox around? Media Center. I might ought to be back. We have some actually some really cool stuff. X Xbox Media Center versus Apple TV as a media viewer, right? That's, Fun a, stuff. that's a great question. And uh, as always, your stack of uh, viewer mails, questions, and comments. And, well, you know what? You're going to have to tune in next week to find out what else is coming on. Dude, one up.com. Thank you very much. What's the name of that uh, that little podcast thing? <laughs> we do the, we do that one up yours show every weekend out on the uh, Friday. We confirm the weekend for you. So it's, it's a pleasure for us to do that for you. What's the URL for that? Uh, I, I don't know. It's in iTunes. Just search one up yours. <laughs> I mean, how hard as that could be, right? Until next time, you've been watching Techzilla. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Garnet Lee. See you next time.